video. This is Sergi and welcome to my YouTube channel. For today's tutorial, I am going to discuss the basic contents your chapter 1 introduction must have in case you are pursuing a quantitative design. Do not worry, we will have a separate discussion for qualitative methods so I recommend you to subscribe to my YouTube channel for you to be updated in my new video tutorial contents. So basically, these are the contents you can find in chapter 1 in background of the study, statement of the problem, objectives of the study, hypothesis, significance of the study, scope and limitation, and the definition of terms. Let us start with the background of the study. So this is a brief statement of the origin of the problem. It is an account describing the circumstances which suggested research. It may include a justification of the selection or choice of the study. So, in this section, you need to present here the situation which warrants the need for you to conduct the study. It is a mask that you present global, national, and local scenarios. It is more appreciated also if you are going to present facts and figures here, or should I say, you should have to say it with numbers, just like this. Almost half of the world live on less than 2.5 US dollars a day, and as reported by UNICEF, 22,000 children die each day due to poverty, and 28% of all children in developing countries are estimated to be underweight. That is from the study of SHA 2011. So this is an example of detailing contents with facts and figures. Now. Your background of the study usually consists two to three pages only, so it should not be lengthy, but enough to relate the rationale. Why is it that there is a need for you to pursue your research? Now, in that number of pages, you have to clearly state what the problem or issue is in relation to the topic with emphasis on the dependent variable. Also, you have to relate background as to the results, assumption reconnection of your independent variables and dependent variable. Also, you need to cite implications of previous works leading to the rationale of the study. And you need also to discuss what was done in the present study, the urgency, the research gap, and the contribution of your study. Now class, I would like to tell you that the conceptualization stage, which is usually integrated in Chapter 1, is always the difficult stage. But once you are done with it, you can move on easily to the next succeeding chapters. Now tip! When you start writing your research, you have to make a draft first by using a clean sheet of paper and pencil. Do not go directly to your Word application file or else you will spend the whole day without nothing to write in the Word document. Also, if you need to have 10 paragraphs in your background of the study, you need to identify and know first what should be the contents of your paragraph. How are you going to tell your story of your paper and how are you going to present facts and figures? Another is you need to observe coherence in your manuscript construction. Your previous paragraph should be relevant to your next paragraph. You have to observe order in detailing your write-up. Take note, as a researcher, it is our responsibility to make our write-up comprehensible to the reader. Avoid one sentence, one paragraph, and you must avoid also one paragraph, one paragraph page. Another tip is you need to allot one day to research all necessary information and details you wanted to include in your write-up and another one day to organize what you have researched. You need to compile all important facts and details in Excel file and automatically get the reference so that 
once you will be needing those important details, you do not need to read it over again in the internet or reread it in the PDF file. You will spend more time looking for it. Instead, just open the Excel file, the one that you compile for easy access. Next is the statement of the problem. The problem studied must be shown as one which arose from a situation of need or unresolved difficulties. The reader must be made to recognize this need. The problem should be stated precisely, accurately, and clearly. Kindly refer to this example. As you can see, there are five SOP or statement of the problem and the problem was defined in terms of the data that can be Pain. In your manuscript, you need to present general problem statement which is in a declarative form. So it is the first one which is to be followed by the specific problem statements which should be in a question form as shown in the slide. So for example, generally the study was conducted to determine the practices of the Human Resource Management Office as well as the satisfaction of the employees in Davao del Norte State College. To be specific, it was so to know the then you have to list your statement of the problem. Now, let us proceed to the objectives of the study. So, the objectives is a brief statement of the purpose which the study or the research hopes to achieve. So, this is just a one general problem statement in a paragraph form, usually one to two. So, this is an example of a research object. Okay, now let's proceed to discuss how to write your research hypothesis. Now, your research hypothesis reflects the general problem under the study. So, it restates the general problem in a form that is precise enough to allow testing. So, it is a clearly stated expression of interest and intent, and that implies a relationship between your variables. Now, there are two ways to state your hypothesis. The first is in a form of a null hypothesis. So, states that there is no relationship between the independent and dependent variables under study. So, another way to state your hypothesis is in alternative way. So, the alternative hypothesis. So, states that a relationship exists between the independent and dependent variables. Most of the time, hypothesis is stated in a form of null hypothesis as shown in this sample. Let's proceed to the significance of the study. Now, this section should show why the problem investigated is important and what significance the results have. It should include a statement on the relevance to felt needs, the potential contribution of the research to new knowledge and policy implications, and other possible uses for each result. Now, Possible beneficiaries and the benefits they will gain from the study should be clearly stated mostly in a paragraph form. One paragraph if it is short or two paragraphs if it is long. But you can also do it in a bullet format which depend upon the format prescribed by your research instructor. So in this section, you really need to identify who would benefit from your study and what benefit they could get from it. Now, so class, note that the order of listing the beneficiaries are not arranged alphabetically, but you should list first the stakeholder who could benefit most from your study. So it's not ABC, but the one who could benefit most from your study should be listed first. Now, the scope and limitation of the study. So, the boundaries of the study should be properly defined. So, in this section, here you can define the boundary and the limitation of your study. The scope is expected to indicate a reasonable area of study which is large enough to be significant but narrow enough to permit careful treatment. So, 
can you look at this example? As you can see, the scope of the problem should be stated specifically. The nature of the subjects treated, their number, the treatments they receive, and any limitations that exist in the reference population, your instrument or your research design should be stated in the scope and limitation of the study. Lastly, the definition of terms. Now, many terms are subject to a variety of interpretation. Such terms should be defined operationally according to the precise meaning they are intended to convey. Now, clear definition should be stated for all important variables, especially if they are to be measured by means of a specific instrument or a combination of devices. Now, well, there are two ways to define words in a research paper. First is by using the conceptual definition, the one we can read in the dictionary, or by using operational definition or how it was being used in your study. Now, please take note that only those words which are operationally used in the study must be put in your definition of terms in order to give clarity and further understandings to your reader. Now, that's all for the contents you need to include in your Chapter 1 introduction. I hope you learned something today. Thank you very much for listening and watching my tutorial videos. Please support me by subscribing and sharing my video tutorials to your friends. If you have suggestions for my next blog tutorial, do not hesitate to comment down below. God bless you everyone. This is Sergi. Until next time.